Tridestone and to all of our friends of Tridestone, we bless God for your presence today and we hope that this word will in, encourage and enlighten you as to where we are in this season. Uh, we certainly want to acknowledge uh, and wish everyone a, a happy Juneteenth uh, this weekend as well as for all the fathers, we wish you a happy Father's Day. I want to just let you know in regards to the word for this week, uh, God has given me uh, the opportunity to see a, a parallel, a revelation between uh, what the Word of God uh, says and related to what's happening in our world today. Injustice and inequality are not a new phenomenon, and the Bible over and over again gives us examples of where we can see how uh, these, these issues are prevalent and has an impact even on the church, that even the church uh, misses the mark with, with the kingdom of God simply because we have allowed demonic forces to come in and to influence our judgment. And we need to begin as a church to look at it for what it truly is and to believe the Bible when it says that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Uh, we, we are seeing a lot of political responses and there are certainly some things that need to be done to tear down the walls of white supremacy for which a lot of hypocrisy in our founding fathers uh, built this legacy. And this legacy is, has now come home to roost where uh, the evil of it is being exposed by God himself. And if you don't realize that God is exposing this, then I would submit to you, you got a hearing problem. Uh, the Lord is being very clear that what he's doing in the season of this pandemic, as well as what is going on with the uprisings uh, that was triggered by that flashpoint of George Floyd being murdered before our eyes. Uh, just want to say it for all of those that, that don't get what's happening here. Uh, God did not allow George Floyd to die because black people needed to see another black man die in the street. We've seen that before. But for white America to see it in its brutality and its wretchedness, they needed to see just how evil it is hoping that that would trigger some repentance. Uh, that, that's really what this whole moment is about. It's about God pushing his people to a place of repentance. And those who cannot repent prove to themselves and to the world that they are not God's people. Regardless of what your color is, if you have an inability to repent, if you have an inability to love, that is proof that you are not God's child. And we're getting a chance to see this work out in some extraordinary ways where people, they don't even have the ability to keep their prejudice and their hatred to themselves. They must declare it. 
and, and it, it speaks consistently with the word that lets us know that those things that come out of our mouths come out of our mouths because it's in our hearts. But today I want to give you a, uh, it's, it's almost a comical thing. My wife and I talk about this from time to time. We'll see how some injustice is played out before our eyes. And, and we see that when someone black is involved, the treatment that black people get is different than what white people get. So we, we kind of name it the black man treatment or the black people treatment. African Americans know that we, are, we have a, a reason to expect that things are not going to be done fair or equitably for us in the United States of America because it, it, it never has been. So for us to see it and recognize it is just an ordinary thing. But I want to get you into the word of God today and, and to show you uh, just how this plays out and where the kingdom of God comes in to really uh, overrule uh, racism and overrule how we would normally handle affairs and to get into the fact that this war that is going on is of a spiritual nature. Uh, one of the biggest gaps in this whole thing in terms of protest and everything else that's going on is, is the church is pulling up the rear on this. And the reason why the church is pulling up the rear is because the church has not repented yet. And as long as the church has not repented, it can't leave. And what God has done has exposed us, and we need to go and take a look at our role. Our role is a spiritual one. And to respond spiritually, you've got to know how God operates. So let me turn you to the Word of God in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, beginning at verse 6, it reads, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and were, were where and we were in the city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by the riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, and of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to pray, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. And when the master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes, and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, 
who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into the house, he sat at meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them, and brought them out, and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison, and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them, and departed. Let me just give you the title of this, Paul and Silas Got the Black Man Treatment. Paul and Silas got the black man treatment. I would have you know that it is a norm for African Americans to receive unjust treatment by officials, by those who have been given offices, power, influence, a gun and a badge. So we are not unfamiliar with being mistreated. But I want you to know this passage of scripture talks about how these kind of moments play out, and how God responds when his people are involved. I want you to know that God himself is concerned about how his children are treated. And his children come in all creeds and colors. And it is important that the church recognize its role in the reconciling of this issue because God is holding the church accountable for how we treat people. One of the things that has become very well known over the last few years is that uh, the church has been negligent in its role to bring the kingdom of God and the peace of God amongst its people because of the idolatry of white supremacy and the idolatry of worshiping those things that are cultural rather than those things that are spiritual. The church has been notoriously dumb and deaf as it relates to spiritual matters. We don't tend to notice things in a spiritual way. And matter of fact, our tendency is to look at everything in a temporal perspective. We look at it only as flesh and blood. We only look at it as political. We look at it as financial. And we don't pay much attention to the signs of the time. As Matthew 16 points out to us, the church has fallen into the state that Pharisees have fallen into. We notice the weather. We can see the changing in the climate, but we don't notice the signs of the time. And where we are right now, the church is desperately in need of a knowledge of the signs of the time. And it is unfortunate that the world has picked up on the move of God faster than the church has. But as I said before, it is because of unrepentance that we find ourselves in this place. 
But in this passage of scripture, uh, beginning at the sixth verse in chapter 16, uh, the Bible lets us know that Paul and Silas are on that missionary journey that we so famously have heard about over and over again about the move of God for Paul and Silas and how it was that God literally limited Paul and Silas from going to places that they wanted to go or thought would be a good idea to go. But the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, prevented them from going to some places. They were forbidden to preach the word in Asia, even though going to Asia seemed like a good idea to them. They were able to listen to the lead of the Holy Spirit and not go. They were going to go to, to Mysia. They were planning, they were thinking about going to Bithynia. They were looking at places where they thought opportunity might be. But instead of following their own intellect, they followed the leading of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that because they were obedient in two cases where they could have gone the wrong place, that when they obeyed, that God sent a vision by night to the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul saw a man in his vision from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. I want you to know that's really what the problem is for the church is that we have not obeyed the move of God by the Holy Ghost. And as a result, we have ended up in the wrong place fighting for causes that God did not give us the authority to even speak over, to even have anything to say about. The church needs to be where God tells it to be. We need to move based upon the plan and purpose of God by the leading of the Holy Ghost. And I need to say that again. I need you to get comfortable hearing the name, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. The church has gotten uncomfortable with the presence and purpose of the Holy Ghost. We have gotten very comfortable with our own intellect and we have gotten very comfortable with our own thinking because we have gotten intoxicated with our own intellect. And I want you to know we're in a place now where we have forgotten that to obey is better than sacrifice. Over these decades, the church has over and over again followed the intellect of people. Well, I want you to know that if you're ever going to be really an instrument of the Lord, you're going to have to obey somewhere along the way. You're going to have to figure out that faith comes by hearing. You've got to hear from God and then move when God tells you to move. That aspect of the church has gone away as we've promoted and propped up things as, as, as our way, our culture, our ide ideology, and it does become idol worship. We have become idol worshipers, and we see in this passage of Scripture that as the Apostle Paul and Silas have gone into this place out of obedience to the move of the Holy Ghost, they find themselves in this city, the city of Philippi, and they're simply waiting on the Lord and doing what a, a child of God should do when you're waiting on God's instruction. The next step ought to be to simply go and pray. So each day they went outside of the city to pray. And as they went outside of the city to pray, they ran into certain women that had also resorted to prayer. And it's interesting that so much of the time the church does not respond to the fact that sometimes women are involved and have a key role in leading and providing for the move of God because they're being humble and submissive in their role. I want to tell us, men, we need to be careful for how we approach things. These women were in tune and reaching out and looking for God. And, and the one woman, Lydia, whose name is mentioned, she was a worshiper of God. She's defined as a worshiper of God. But when she hears the gospel as it's being preached by the Apostle Paul, God opens up her heart and she begins to hear those words and she receives the gospel. And she's not only moved by the gospel, she's moved to do something for the kingdom. So she, she impresses upon Pilate, Paul and Silas that if you have found me faithful, come into my home. And the word says that she and all of her family were baptized and that Paul and Silas stayed with them over a period of time and each day they went out outside of the city by the riverside to pray. And as they were going, as is typical, the devil tries to attach himself or to distract from the work of God, the will of God, the purpose of God. And for many days, the Bible says, for many days a young woman who had a spirit of divination was following Paul and Silas as they went out each day to pray. And this woman having this spirit of divination, let me just point out now, it's a demon in control of this young woman. And 
the, the, the spiritual gift that she seems to have is to be able to, to divine things, to tell fortunes. She made her money that way, and she had an owner. So in other words, she was a slave. She was a slave to the demon that was ruling her with the spirit of divination, and she was a slave to some men. And because of her role in the spirit of divination each day as Paul and Silas went out to pray, she would say, these men be servants of the Most High God who come to show us the way of salvation. So day after day, Paul had to endure hearing this one who was from the enemy camp declaring, these men be servants of the Most High God who come to show us the way of salvation. So after a while, Paul's spirit got vexed because it was obvious to him that this demon was trying to show affiliation with the real move of God. And I want to tell you, this is how the devil operates on the church. And sometimes the church, because it's not as spiritual as it needs to be, gets caught up in anybody that appears to have some kind of a spiritual gift. What this woman had, even though she could discern that Paul and Silas were servants of the Most High God, she was not with them. And sometimes the church has gone along with letting people who have the appearance of some, any kind of spirituality to be with them when they're not really with them. So what Paul did is he turned and he declared to that unclean spirit that was in this young woman to come out of her. And as he declared in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out of her, that same hour that spirit came out. And the result of that is because she no longer had that unclean spirit, she no longer had that spirit of divination, she could no longer make money off of sharing these, these, these unclean spiritual gifts. So what she was now is a servant to a man who no longer had power to divine other people's futures. So her owners were upset. Her owners grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace so that they could be dealt with and the magistrates immediately rent the clothes off of Paul and Silas and commanded that they would be beaten on the spot. These men said they brought an accusation against Paul and Silas. And remember now, they point out these men being Jews. Don't miss that now. These men being Jews teach customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adhere to. So because they are Jews, or because like African Americans, because they are black, we don't want to have anything to do with their culture or their customs, and they bring an accusation against them, and before even any kind of a trial or jury can be set up, they have already gone to punishment, and they beat Paul and Silas. They whip them in public, and not only that, after they whip them in public, they turn them over to a prison and they tell the jailer, keep these men securely. Lock them up and make sure that they don't get out. So Paul and Silas are not only taken to jail, they are taken to the jail inside the jail. They are taken to the innermost part of the jail and their feet are put into stocks so that they cannot move, that they cannot get away. So they are covered on all sides with security. So they're over police. They're already in the jail, but they put some added forces on top of that in order to make sure that the mistreatment that they receive is as extreme as possible. Is anybody hearing me? Are we not seeing this very same thing go on in the streets of the United States of America where African Americans are given a different kind of judicial uh, uh, approach than white Americans are? You know, it's an interesting thing when you think about slavery and African Americans coming out of that and still getting continued mistreatment. We need to pause for just a moment and talk about the evil of slavery that has led to this moment that we're in. And we need to just be careful to say it like it is, 
that America has not repented of slavery. Yes, there was an Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, it took uh, 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 two years for all of the people who were set free to find out about it. That's what the Juneteenth is about. But you got to look at this in the biblical context of what slavery is. Slavery is a particularly arrogant evil. It's an arrogant evil because you as a white person, your ancestors believed so much in their whiteness that they decided to subjugate another race and to make themselves a god over that race where we had to obey you and bow to you and bow our heads and walk on the other side of the street to try to avoid the wrath of white people. That is something that is an arrogant evil. And because you don't even want to talk about it, because you don't want to have it put in the history books, because you don't want to pay reparations, it is proof that you have not repented of this thing. Anybody that you have wounded in the legal system, some sort of reprieve or reparations would be normal. But to bring that up in the United States of America is to sound militant. Well, if I sound militant to you today, let, just call me militant. Because you need to know that this thing is on a scale that God himself is judging. You need to know that God is judging the United States of America for an unrepented evil that continues to cycle. We are now, we have gone to sleep and awakened in the 1960s, even though it is 2020 today. How is it possible for us to wake up and be in the 1960s all over again. It is because what was done in the 60s was incomplete and the repentance was not real. Our founding fathers had slaves and they were being hypocrites to make statements like we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. How do you say those words and yet be a slave owner? How do you say those words and look at your slaves and not realize that you're denying them the words that you claim are self-evident. If they are self-evident, then why is it that you don't see? And I, I ask God, you know, I want to help understand some of this. How is it that, that white people in America who have done this, and even their, their, their offspring who continue to oppress, how is it that they're comfortable with this. Well, let me tell you what I have discerned thus far. There may be many more things to it, but let me tell you what I have discerned from the Lord thus far. That the act of slavery is so evil that in order for you to have peace with it, you've got to justify those that you're mistreating as not deserving any better. So in order for you to reconcile the evil of putting yourself above God's creation. God created black people. God created us. And you need to understand that for you to put yourself over them and think you are better than them is to declare that you know more than God does. It is a particularly arrogant evil. And I want you to know that God has a problem with people who have this arrogant evil. And it's in the church. you got to understand, white supremacy is in the church. The Southern Baptist Convention, of which I am a part of, the Southern Baptist Convention, post-slavery or during slavery, they preached a gospel of slavery. They justified and made excuses for slavery, even though it was evil. So they made excuses for it, and people maybe in a way to kind of protect their own self-conscience. Maybe they made up in their minds that we got to treat them this way because they don't deserve any better. You had to beat your slaves a certain amount of time. You had to keep them down. Well, that same kind of military action continued in our police force, where beating black people down was the norm. The laws were written to keep black people down. I took a course at Long Beach State years ago called The Black Man and the Law. 
And I found out that there are so many laws, chattel laws, still on the books that people don't take off the books because in order to take them off, you'd have to admit that they were there in the first place. There's so many things that have been done that those who have power try to rewrite the rules like our president does. You keep telling a lie long enough, you think that people will believe it. Well, I got news for you. The grace of God will overrule all lies. The grace of God will flip the script just like he did recently. Just a few weeks ago, nobody wanted to talk about black issues in the midst of the pandemic. I wrote a letter to all of the Southern Baptists in the state of California, all of my fellow DOMs and to our executive director, letting them all know that the Lord had told me that the chickens had come home to roost and that this thing that is going on, the coronavirus, is God leveling the playing field. God taking away our ability to judge people based upon the color of their skin. They might be your same color, but they got a virus potentially that could be deadly to you. So he took away our ability to judge people based upon just the color of their skin. And God also made us leave one another alone until we come to a place where we realize we got to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. And I want to show you. Go with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. I want you to see in verses 5 and 6 what's really going on. This is, this is where, uh, this, is, this is part of the Ten Commandments. And this is where I know you probably want to run and hide in a hurry, hoping that this thing is not really true. But you need to hear the word of the Lord today. The word of the Lord says, thou shall not bow down. This is God talking about not having any, any idol gods, not having any graven images. God's saying that he's a jealous God. He's not going to accept his people worshiping idol gods. So when it picks up in verse 5, it says, thou shall not bow down thyself to them. He's saying, don't worship idol gods, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Let me explain to you what's going on here. God said when he laid out the Ten Commandments, that he was going to visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation. I want to tell you that from the time of the end of slavery, we are now into the third and fourth generation, and this is directed at those who hate God. He says, to those that hate me, I am going to visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation, to those that hate me, and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So he's saying, I'm going to visit this thing in particular on those who hate me. So ask the question, I want to answer it for you, who are those who hate God? Those who hate God are those who do not love their neighbor like they love themselves. The Bible says, that if a man says he loves God and yet hates his, his brother, the Bible says he is a liar. For how can a man love God whom he has never seen and hate his brother that he has seen? It is a ridiculous thought for you to claim you love God whom you have never seen and to hate your brother. And let me add to that just my two cents on it. How can you claim you love people that you systematically steal rights away from and claim you love them at the same time? To steal opportunity from them, to steal freedom from them, and yet claim you love God at the same time? The Bible says you're a liar. The Bible says the truth is not in you. The Bible declares it. But in the midst of those who are amongst the white community who have ancestors who were slave masters, some of them love God. Some of them 
are going to be rescued. So this moment, this death of George Floyd, this marching in the street is to save those who love God and to punish those who do not. The church needs to understand this is where we are by divine appointment. You cannot escape this thing quickly. You cannot snap your fingers and it'll go away. You cannot pretend compassion and it'll go away. You've got to go and dismantle every obstacle you put up against God's people. You got to understand something. That it's some black folks that saved. I know I'm one. I know I'm saved. And how do I know I'm saved? I got proof in my chastisement. Let me explain something to you. If God does not chasten you, it's because you're not his. The Bible says that if you don't get the chastening, it's because you're a bastard. Yeah, I said it. You're not the real thing. Your lineage is in question. So God chastening you is a good thing. So don't pretend that God does not have authority to chasten you because you're white. He has authority to chasten everybody regardless of their color. And I want to tell you again, Paul and Silas, they got the black man treatment. They were beaten in public. They were thrown in jail. They were put in the jail inside the jail. They had their feet even in stocks. There was no way for them. But I want to tell you the church needs to respond like Paul and Silas. Because you got to remember now, they're in Macedonia because the Holy Ghost set it up. you got to get this. Where we are is the place that the Holy Ghost set up. They're in jail because they obeyed God. They're in prison because they obeyed God. Paul and Silas were beaten in Philippi because they obeyed God. And because they knew that they had obeyed God, even though their feet were locked in the stocks, even though they were in the jail inside the jail, the Bible says that about midnight that they began to pray and to sing him. And I want to tell you that Paul and Silas should not have been beaten because they were Roman citizens. But I want to tell you that the reason why they were beaten is because they were kingdom citizens. And when you lock up a kingdom citizen, I want to let you know I don't care how you oppress black people. If there's some saved folks amongst the black people, you must understand God is coming for you. The Bible declares that when they begin to pray and when they begin to sing, that an earthquake came. You got to understand, they were sons of God locked up in jail, sons of God. Locked up in a prison, sons of God, with their feet in the stocks. And the Bible says that when they begin to pray and to sing hymns, that God caused an earthquake and all the jail doors swung open and all of the chains fell off. That's some kind of earthquake. You see, when you are a kingdom citizen, that's bigger than being a Roman citizen. They threw them in jail even though they were Roman citizens, but the kingdom citizenship flung the doors open. And I want to tell you today, that's what God is doing while people are marching in the streets. God is flinging the doors open. God is declaring, let my people go. It's been 400 years as of 2019. It's been 400 years since black people were enslaved in this country. 400 years. That's a significant number. 
And I want to tell you this number is about reconciliation at this moment. It's either going to be reconciliation or condemnation. If you can change, regardless of your color, you better change now. Because I want you to know something. God is not negotiating with you. He's not going to say you can negotiate this down to something less than repentance. He's not negotiating. The coronavirus, we don't know how many times people can catch it. We don't know that there will ever be a vaccine. We just don't know. And I want to tell you, ignoring it and this heresy of the power of positive thinking that our president believes in, it does not matter what you think if you do not agree with God. I don't care how positive it is. He keeps saying over and over again, oh, it's just going to go away. It will go away when God says go, it's going to go away, not when Donald Trump says. And I want you to know, you better figure out whose side you're on quick because none of us are going to escape this salvation-defining moment. Yes, I said it. It is a salvation-defining moment. If you don't choose the Lord now, you will be answering for this in the day of judgment. If you don't repent of your racism now, you will be standing in the judgment having to answer how come you did not love your neighbor like you loved yourself. Racism, slavery, it is a particularly arrogant sin. It says that you believe that you are above the creation of God that's in his image and in his likeness. You made yourself an idol. You made whiteness an idol. And how did we get there? I'm going to say this and I'll be done. How did we get there? Well, we got there because we see the motivation for beating Paul and Silas. It was because of greed. The demon of greed led to the demon of hatred. Because the money got changed, hatred for Paul and Silas resulted in a public beating. I want to tell you that's what's happened to African Americans. Greed. Greed so strong that people took long journeys across the oceans to kidnap black people, to make them work without wages. Greed. Greed. Fed by hatred, and then hatred fed by greed. Two demons. Those two demons are still at work in America. And the only way those demons are going to be taken down is we've got to find out what obedience looks like. God is trying to tell us to love our neighbor. The coronavirus is trying to tell us to love our neighbor so that you can be safe again. The death of George Floyd is telling us to love our neighbor so that God will be pleased with his church. Church, we are way behind. And I want you to know, I feel like Paul and Silas today. I know that black people have been locked up in circumstances for a long time, but we are not going to leave town unless you come get us out of this. You put us in this. You put us in the jail. That's what Paul said. You beat us publicly. You mistreated us publicly. And now you're going to say, go on and just go out of town privately? No. Repentance in order for repentance to be real you got to talk about it, and you got to declare, I am going to pull down everything I set up that was wrong. We are not going to leave quietly. Paul said, no, you come and get me out of jail. I'm not going to leave here 
quietly. Paul told him, said, I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. Y'all thought I didn't deserve what you had. You thought I didn't deserve what you had. So you mistreated me because of my culture. You thought I didn't deserve what you had. Paul said, I'm a Roman just like you. But he could have gone further, and I'm closing. He could have gone further. He could have said, I am a citizen of the kingdom of the Most High God. And you cannot mistreat me and act like it didn't happen. Repent or be damned. Repent or be damned. How much more obvious does God need to be for you? God bless you and God keep you.